don't know how many people here watch the news. I try not to a whole lot. I reckon I catch clips of news off of YouTube. We got an Amazon Fire Stick, and I can get YouTube and a whole bunch of stuff on my TV because of the Fire Stick. And, and I pick and choose what I want to listen to as far as the news. And I won't tell you which station I listen to. Um, pretty conservative one, but um, I'll just leave it at that. But um, there's a lot of stuff going on in our country. A lot of dissension, um, people disagreeing and all of that. And, and I want us to take a moment and just pray for our country, pray for our leaders. And I know that in your bulletin there, um, on the one side where it says to pray for your leaders, and then it talks about the national, state, local, and the church, and our military personnel in Israel. We just need to pray for our country, I believe that. And I think we need to make it very um, specific and be very intentional about, about praying. There's lots of fear. There's lots of confusion. Um, you know what? Even in churches, there's been division over the sickness, the virus, over um, vaccinations, over this and that. And I don't know if many of you probably don't look, but if you were to go to the Virginia Church of God webpage, our general was here put up. There's a nice article that basically says, there are two sides. One says, vaccinate, vaccinate. They're the greatest thing. There's another side that says, no, they're not. No, they're not. Don't get it. And as a church, here's what we've decided. It's a choice between you, your doctor, and you pray about it, and you do what you feel is best for you. Inside these four walls, you know what we are? We're the family of God, and we're going to be a family. We may not agree on everything. How many have family members you don't agree with? Anybody? I hope you still talk to them. You can still be friends, but we don't agree even as families. Within your own immediate family, you don't always agree. You know what? We're going to have different sides and come from things different angles. But here's what's going to happen. We're still the family of God, and we're going to be one in here. We're not going to let any of this divide us, and we're not going to let what's going on in our country divide us. We don't want to see our country divide us. So we're going to take a moment this morning, and we're going to... To pray for our country and I'm just going to ask you to pray how you feel led to pray but we're just going to pray that um, God will touch God will bless we have leaders that need direction amen state local we have families that need God's hand upon them they're hurting in so many ways and I believe God still does that so let's you would just join me in prayer. Father, we thank you that in the midst of everything, we can come to you knowing that you are our answer. That no matter what happens, no matter what's going on, it's not caught you by surprise. You're not confused. You're not unsure of what to do. Lord, you're still there and you're working. So, Lord, we just ask right now that you will touch our country. The Lord, you will touch our leaders at the at the federal and the state and the local level, that, Lord, as they make decisions that affect our lives, that affect the course of our country, the Lord, that they will be impressed by you. Lord, they will feel your calling upon their lives. That, Lord, they will take the direction that, Lord, you desire them to do. Lord, I pray for people today and their families and, and our churches that, Lord, that have been broken apart by so many things. Lord, I pray that you will bring us together, that, Lord, as your body, as a church, as a body of Christ, that, Lord, we will be one with a voice that says Jesus is still the answer and he's still our hope. Lord, men broken hearts. People have lost loved ones. Lord, we know that. But, Lord, you're able to heal. You're able to mend. You're able to put back together. Lord, restore families. Restore homes. Restore jobs. Restore finances. Restore health. Lord, we just ask that, Lord, you will do something that's amazing, that we will be able to stand back and look and see that God has moved and know that without a doubt that you're still working, you're still holding us in your hand, and no matter what happens, you are going to be there. 
Lord, I just pray for each one that's here today. The Lord, that you will continue to bless them, that you will continue to touch them. The Lord, with the confusion, and Lord, the anger, and the hurt, and the dissension that's, Lord, going around, that, Lord, we will stand united, saying that God is our hope, that Jesus is our Savior, the Holy Spirit is our comforter, and he empowers us to live in this time in which we are living. And the Lord, no matter what happens, we are going forward with you. Thank you, Lord, for what you are doing. Thank you for your healing. Thank you for your touch. Thank you for your presence that is ever there. And Lord, we exalt you and we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It is great to be able to call upon God and know that he's there and know that he's helped. Now, a couple of things before I get into my message, and I'm excited about getting into this. Um, September the 19th is Back to Church Sunday. Joseph, are we up yet? Good. Um, September 19th is Back to Church Sunday, and the theme is going to be Hope is Here. How many know that we need hope? Anybody ever been at a point in your life where you've lost hope? Okay. When all hope is lost, things get tough. We have hope in Jesus, and, and hope is here. You should have found one of these in your bulletin. Next week, you will have an invite card. This is not necessarily an invite card, because in the back it explains about Back to Church Sunday. I want you to take this and read. I want you to start thinking about there are lots of people that attended church at some point in their life, and for whatever reason, they've just gotten out. Got out of the habit of going. Um, got hurt, confused, just life got busy, and they got out of church. But you know what? I believe that as we gather together, we find hope for life ahead of us. And we can do life, they, and sometimes I don't like this phrase, we can do life together. We need one another. If you're just trying to go through life on your own, you're going to be hurting. We need one another. So be thinking about somebody you want to invite. This will tell you about it. You'll get an invite postcard or two. Next week, let's make that a great Sunday. And we're getting ready to wrap up our summer Bible study, um, Daily Nuggets from the Gospel of John. Next Sunday, we'll have our last um, get-together where you pack a lunch. We'll come and sit around and talk about any questions that you have, and I'll try to ask them. And just to remind you, it is not a stump the pastor luncheon. That is not what it is. You're not coming to get me. I'm going to be there to help you and answer questions if you have them. So um, that's going to end this week and the last luncheon is next Sunday. But on the back at the info table, you will see the next study that we're going to do is First and Second Peter. Um, it is seven weeks. First Peter has five chapters. Second Peter has two. There are two options. You can just do it at home during the week on your own, and we'll get together twice like we've done during the summer. Or if you would rather have like an in-person, we're going to do a Zoom option where you can pull it up on your computer, on your phone, and all of that, where you can each week get together with me and whoever else is doing Zoom, and we can talk about it each week. So you can do it for, I think it's three weeks, and we have a luncheon, and then four weeks, and we have a luncheon, or you can do it each week through Zoom. And Zoom is really easy. I can walk you through that. You just get the app, and... I send it to you, you click on the link, and boop, there it is, and you get to see me. Okay. <laughs> I knew there would be at least one person that's excited about that. I knew that. Okay. So, um, we're going, that's back on the back table. The only thing I ask is this, when you pick it up, and sign your name, and pick which option you're doing, because I want to know how many I should expect on the Zoom study, okay? That way I can make sure I have your information and can send it out to you. So just put down what option you're going to do. Option one is adjust at home. Option two is Zoom. And if you're doing option two and you still want to come to lunch and pack a lunch, do that. You pick option one and you want someone to jump in on the Zoom, do that. Whatever is up to you. But I want you to be a part of this. Um, I've enjoyed the one during the summer. The last time we got together, I had lots of questions and um uh, if I get stumped, I just look at my wife and say, what do you think? 
And she, she tells me what I need to know. <laughs> but white men, never mind. Let's move on. All right. We're talking about blessed families. And sometimes families don't seem very blessed, do they? Sometimes they just seem messed up. Sometimes our families just seem to be in chaos, and we're like, what's going on? Can't wait till these kids get old enough and they leave. <laughs> then when they get old enough and they leave, you're like, man, I wish having, I miss having the kids at home. Then once they come back to visit, man, I'm so glad they got their own home and they're leaving. <laughs> we get all of these different things, and then as you go on in life, sometimes you pick up greater responsibilities where you pick up a loved one that you're taking care of or something like that. And families just... The dynamic seems to always be changing, but here's what I believe. I believe that our families can be blessed simply through the Lord. The blessed family. So today we're going to be talking about the blessed marriage. And as we get ready to start that, I would like for uh, Samuel and Steve and Chance, if you all would come, I want to give you each a stack of these. I want you to give each person one of these. This is going to be, this is uh, our updated and refreshed declaration that we will do together. It's, it's very similar to what we have, but it's just changed a little bit. I want to take the focus a little more off of us and put it on Jesus and make sure we understand that it's Jesus that is the source of everything for us and everything that we need. If everybody has one of those, if you would, stand with me one more time. We're going to say this together. Say it like you mean it and you believe it. Uh, Joseph, can you go back to that? It's not up there? Oh, I thought I had it saved. We'll read it off your card today. In Christ Jesus, I am the righteousness of God. He has freed me from guilt, shame, and condemnation and covered me with his favor. Because of his great love, I have abundant supply and divine protection. By faith, I am who he says I am, and I receive what he has for me. Amen. You may be seated. So last week we started looking at the blessed families, and today the title of the, the message is The Blessed Marriage. And some of you may say, well, Pastor, I'm not married right now. I'm looking to get married. I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt, I'm not going back. Um, remember I had uh, someone that I worked with at one time said, you know what? If something would ever happen to my husband, I would not get remarried. I said, you wouldn't. They go, oh, no, I've done that, and that's going to be my time now. I've been married. I remember uh, years ago, I was a little bit late getting home. It was back before everybody had cell phones. It was a normal thing. And we lived uh, behind Burger King on Greenville Avenue. Remember, it's McDonald's, not Burger King, um, Senior Saints um, next Sunday. But um, and my wife happened to hear a rescue squad go by. And it alarmed her a little bit because I hadn't called to let her know I was going to be home late. Men, don't do that. Call. So I get home. She goes, where have you been? This and that. So, well, okay. And she goes, I happen to hear an ambulance go by. And I'm like, what would I do if something happened to him? I said, well, what did you come up with? What would you do? I said, would you get remarried? Oh, no. I said, you wouldn't get remarried? No. I said, have I ruined it for you that much? You no. I just wouldn't need to do it again. I've already done that. I, I did all of that. And she goes, well, what would you do? I said, oh, I'd get remarried. She goes, you would? She goes, I figured that. I said, oh, I've already got three names in my pocket. I just wait for something to happen. I'll go right down the list. <laughs> I took those names out. So <laughs> actually, there were no names in there. But um, so. But marriage is under attack. They said back in 1930, 83% of adult Americans were married. In 2006, and I know you say, well, Pastor, that's about 15 years ago. But in 2006, the percentage was down to 55.7. Fewer and fewer people are choosing the marriage route. For, for some reason, I think marriage has been under attack. Marriage has been... Um, 
We'll take some piece of away, just a piece of paper. And I, I think that paper is still very valuable and important in, in God's eyes. Today I want to look at Matthew 19 is where we're going to start. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 5. And, and I want you to understand something from the start. This passage talks about divorce. And I know people have been divorced. And I'm not here to condemn. I know things happen. And I know things that are out of people's control happen. So I'm not here to condemn, make you feel bad about divorce. Because I believe that God forgives. And he blesses your life and moves your head. I believe that with all of my heart. So I want you to understand, I'm going to talk about this. And then we're going to get into Ephesians 5 where it talks about what a, what a marriage looks like in husband's. You should start to get a little antsy because there's going to be some pressure put on you from Ephesians chapter 5. But I believe that we can have a blessed marriage. You know, marriage takes two people, and you know, sometimes marriage is just hard. Can anybody say amen to that? Can you say it's hard to be married? Even when you're in love, it's hard. I did premarital counseling last Sunday for a wedding I'm going to do in October. And I looked at him and said, I gotta tell you something. My wife says I have to tell every couple I'm married. You're gonna look at your husband, you're gonna look at your wife one of these days and say, you know what? Right now I don't like you. I may love you and I'm committed to you, but right now I don't like you. So get out of here, go somewhere else. I need to be alone away from you. Now, I have never felt that way about my wife. And I always tell her I said it, honey. I but I have, and you have. But it doesn't stop the love that God puts in there, the commitment that we have. And so marriage sometimes is hard. And here in Matthew 19, it says this, The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning, made them male and female, and said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now I want to pause there for just a moment. He made them male and female. From the very beginning, God set in motion the genders. Okay, now I'm going to say something, and if you disagree with me, we can talk later. I believe God made male and female. I don't believe there's an unlimited number of genders. I don't believe that there's multiple genders. I don't believe that you're gender fluid or anything like that. I believe God made you male and female. He did it perfectly. He did it, he did it correctly. You are who God made you, and you are wonderful and beautiful how God made you. He made them male and female, and it says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. When we come together in marriage, we become one. It's no longer you and her or, or you and him. It's now you together. It's you are one and him. And it goes on and says, so then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. He's talking about marriage and divorce. And they've come to him and said, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And they often did this to Jesus to try to trap him, to try to get him in a corner and see if they could, could um, get one over on him. So they've come to him, and, and you've got to understand, he said here, what does it say here? And he answered that at the beginning God made them male and female, and we'll find out in just a moment that Moses allowed them for a reason. But I want you to understand, marriage is supposed to be where you come together and you become one. And some people say, well, you know, marriage has got to be a 50-50 thing. I want to say this. If you say it's 50-50, you're coming up short. It's got to be all in or not in. It's got to be 100, 100. You've got to put everything into it. You say, well, Pastor, that makes you vulnerable. Yeah, it does. But you've got to be all in because when you do, that's a point when I believe God can bless it. But it's got to be all in. It's not going to be, well, that's her part and this is my part. She does that and I do this. Well, if you do that and somebody gets sick, there's going to be parts that are missing. We've all got to do our part. Whatever needs to be done, get it done. Okay? It's not a 50-50. It's 
100% commitment on both parts. It's for this reason a man is to be equally yoked to his wife, and they become one. They're joined together, and let no man separate. Because it goes on in Matthew 19 and verses 7 and 8, and says this. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? So he says, you know what? You get married and you become together as one flesh. He said, okay, so why did Moses allow it to happen? Why did he permit it and give a command to give a certificate of divorce? Look what he said. And he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Why did Moses permit it? Because of hardness of heart. And if you look many a times when a marriage ends, there's someone in that marriage that has a hardness of their heart. Sometimes it's both. But there's a hardness there. there there's an un, un, ungiving, an unyielding, an unwielding heart. And they just and it's just like to say, you know what? It's just hard. Now let me explain to you what was happening here. When it became a part of the law, men were marrying other women than just their first wife. So they were having multiple wives, and what they were doing is neglecting their first wife, abusing her, and even sometimes letting others abuse her, and just not letting her go free. So here's what happened. So it became a part of the law, and Moses then made a commandment, said, you know what? Instead of mistreating or abusing your wife, you know what you ought to do? Just let her go. He's not saying... Just get a divorce for any reason. He said, you know what? If you're not going to treat her right, then you need to just let her go. Is what Moses was telling them. He's not saying, you know what, just for whatever reason. You know, for today, it seems like in the society in which we live, people say, well, you know what? It's just a piece of paper. We'll do what we have, whatever we want. You'll hear me talk about it a little bit. Some people say, you know what? Marriage ought to be a contract that has an expiration date. You know what, when you get married, you know what, we're going to make this contract for five years. At the end of five years, if we want to stay married, we will. We'll re-up the contract. If we don't, we both walk away. Church, when we get to the point where it's just a contract, we're missing the relationship and the commitment that God wants us to have within our homes and within our marriage. Now, I want you to understand, I'm not condemning anybody. I don't know what happened in your situation. I know there are times that people have had to walk away for their safety, for their sanity, for, for whatever reason. But what I'm saying is, usually when that happens, there's somebody that has gotten a hard heart. There's somebody that Moses said, because of the hardness of your hearts, of how you were treating or mistreating or abusing, it needed to happen. But you know what? He said, whatever God put together, let not man put asunder. John 1, 17 says this, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. See, the law came through Moses. So they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Jesus said, no, it's not. They said, well, Moses said you could. He said, under the law, you can't. You would think it would be the opposite. You would think that the law would say you can't divorce, but the law is very rigid and stern. And then under grace, you say, well, you know what? If you just just go ahead and do it, but it's the other way around. Grace says no. You're in a covenant. You work it out. But you know what? The law says, yeah, you got a hard heart. Just let her go. But you know what Jesus said there? For this reason because of the hardness of your heart for this reason to go back to that verse 5 of Matthew 19 for this reason what reason we're going to look at that reason for a second Jesus said for this reason what did he say a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined his wife and the two shall become for this reason there's something special about marriage there's something powerful about Marriage. And I want to look at three things about a blessed marriage. The number one thing is marriage represents God on this, this earth. See, go back to Matthew 19, 4 through 5. It says this, And he answered and said to them, 
Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? He said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then in Genesis 1, 26, it said this. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. And that's how he created him. Male and female, he created them. See, God said, let us make man man in our image. Us is three in one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All of God, all three parts, the triune God was there at creation. He says, let us make man, male and female, in our image. If you remember back to last week, Adam actually means mankind. When God created Adam and Eve, he said he called them Adam. He called them both Adam. It wasn't until after they sinned and they fell and death and destruction came in that Adam looked at his wife and said, you know what? I'm going to call you Eve. But God called them Adam, mankind, all one together. Male and female is the image of God. But you ought to understand, when he put them together, he put them together in a marriage, Adam and Eve, husband and wife. When God wanted to create a portrait of himself on the earth, he created a marriage. He put together Adam and Eve said, well, well, what's the third one? Well, that's Jesus. We need to have Jesus in our lives. We need Jesus in our marriage. The Bible tells us that a three-strand three cord is not easily broken. You know what? We've got to have God in the midst of our marriage. If we try to do marriage without him, we're in trouble. You try to live life without him, you're in trouble. We need him in the midst of it. We need him to put hold us together. Marriage is the image of God. Satan hates marriage because it's the image of God on this earth. And if you look around from every angle, marriage is under attack. And I'm not going to name it by name. I don't want to cause controversy, but if you'll look at one of the big organizations through last summer, through all of the riots that happened, one of the big organizations, if you were to go to the website and look at their stated goals, one of them is to destroy traditional marriage. It's there. God created man and woman. He created marriage for men and women to come together as one. We need to understand it's it's God's it's God's image and it represents him on earth. See, Satan did not attack Adam, did not attack him to the image of God appeared on the earth. That's when he got scared. When Adam and Eve were together, he attacked. As God is a triune God and marriage is the image of God, it's got to be three in one. A husband and wife and God. That's a blessed marriage. But you see, not only does marriage represent God on earth, marriage represents Christ and the church. It's powerful that it represents Christ and the church. In a world where marriage is undervalued and just seen as a piece of paper, God still says it's important. Let's go to Ephesians 5. This is where a lot of this is where I spend a good portion of my premarital counseling. So notice what it says. For this reason. What did Jesus say? For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become what? One flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So he said, you know what? Said the marriage represents Christ and the church. So he said, what, what does he tell you to do? Husbands, love your wives as yourself. I've seen some men, some husbands, they must not love themselves very well how they treat their wives. I've seen that. 
My wife is not my old lady. In fact, she reminds me, I am six months younger than you. She doesn't let me forget that. When I had my birthday and turned 53, she said, I'm only 52. Actually, she's 37. I'm sorry, honey. She's 37. Whew. I made a mistake there. She's not the ball and chain. If she is, she ought to take the chain and wrap it around your neck. Men, love your wives. Don't call her your old lady the ball and chain. She's to be respected. A princess. He says, love your wife as yourself. You go around self calling yourself the old man? I hope not. You may be getting older, but you don't call yourself the old man. And it says, wives, respect your husband. And I'm just going to throw this in here real quick. We're going to get to some more stuff. I believe the greatest way for the greatest reason for a wife to respect her husband is because he loves her like no one else does. And he treats her like a queen or a princess, whichever one you prefer to say. See, Jesus gave up everything for the church. And if marriage represents Christ in the church, Jesus gave up everything for the church. He gave up the glory of heaven. He came down here and he lived and he died for us. He doesn't mistreat the church. He doesn't make her the butt of the joke. He doesn't ridicule the church's mistakes, but he loves and gives his life for her. If Christ wouldn't do it for the church, then we shouldn't be doing it men to our wives. Husbands, treat your wife as a princess as she should be. See, in Ephesians, Ephesians 5, you go back earlier, here's what it, here's, oh, excuse me, Ephesians 20, verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He, he who loves his wife loves himself. There it says it over and over. Husbands, love your wives as you love yourself. If you love yourself, you'll love your wife. Treat your wife in a way that Christ treats the church. That's the blessed marriage. Love your wives. Men, I want to encourage you. Love your wives. If you're not married, when you do get married, love your wives. Treat them the way they ought to be treated. They're special. Amen? Women, you all should have been just jumping up and down and hollering on that. Come on now. Women, you've got to believe you're special. You're a wife. You're special. But this is what it goes on and says in, in, uh, in earlier in verses 22 and 24. It says, wives, submit to your own husband. Stop. Right there. Now I'm starting to create problems. But I want you to know this is the, the scriptures. This isn't me. I'm just reading scripture. Wives, submit to your husband as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. Men. Don't be saying amen quite, quite yet. So also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. And that's when he went to verse 25 and says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. You know why we as the church submit to the lordship of Christ? Because of what he did at the cross for us. Because he gave everything for us. Because he died for us. Because of him, we can have healing in our life. Because of him, he said, I'll supply every need that you have. Because of Jesus, he said, I'll take everything that's bad, all of the bad stuff, and I'll turn it to good for those that love the Lord. Church, we love him because of what he's done for us. We submit to him because he loves us so much. Husbands, as you love your wife, you know what happens? She'll look to you as the head of the home, as the head of the family. Not that you lord over her. You're equals together. When you make decisions, you talk and everything. But because of the love and the respect, we're able to say, you know what? I'll let you take the leadership. I'll follow with you. We'll walk together. But I need you to love me. And he says, wives, submit and respect your husband. Now, there is a scripture that later on that says, you know what? It says, old, tells the older women to teach the younger women how to love their families. So women, you are to love your husband. 
But you know the command that right here was said, husbands, love your wives. Then you have a responsibility to love and treat your wife as Christ treats the church. You need to love Husbands love, wives honor. The third thing about marriage that marriage represents is this, a commitment. It's a covenant. Marriage is important to God. It's his image on the earth. It represents Christ in the church, and it represents a covenant. Now, I want to read a scripture from Malachi. Go ahead and put that up there. So Malachi 2, 14 says, Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. He said, you know what? There's something that's happened because of how you're treating your wife. See, many see, as I said before, many see marriage as just a contract, not a covenant. But there are some that would have marriage and say it ends with, a, with an end date. Well, let me give you a difference. A contract. Many of you have entered into contracts. When you've bought a home, you've entered into a contract. If you have bought a car, you've signed a contract, basically, for a loan. All of these things. A contract, we protect our rights, and we limit our responsibility. That's what a contract does. It respects your rights and limits your responsibility. But when you enter into a covenant, it's just the opposite. A covenant says we give up our rights and we pick up our responsibility. See, a marriage is a covenant. See, what was happening, happening here in Malachi, he's telling the people why he's not accepting their offerings. The first reason, their faith was out of order. The second reason is their families. And the third reason is their finances. Finance, he's telling them, I'm not receiving your worship or your offering. Then why? What did he say? You have dealt treacherously with the wife of your youth. She is your companion and a wife by covenant. When we got married, or if you're waiting to get married, remember, it's a covenant. It's something that says, I'm giving up and I'm taking on. 1 Peter 3, 7 says this. Husbands likewise dwell with them, that's their wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. How many remember the words you said when you got married? Anybody remember them? Um, for richer or for poorer? And for many of you, when you started out, you were on the poorer side, looking to get to the richer side. In sickness and in health. And then what about that part that says for better, for worse? As you go through life, you, you experience better, you experience worse. And I've done some marriage counseling, and people say, well, it's gotten really bad. Uh-huh. And then it goes, you went on and you said this, till death do us part. That's a covenant you entered. Now, I remember hearing a story by, about Billy and Ruth Graham. All of you know who Billy Graham is, and Ruth Graham was his wife, and they were talking with her, and they'd been married many, many years, and they looked at her and said, you know what, have you ever been mad? And Bill, oh yeah, I've been mad. Have you ever thought about divorce? Nope. Never thought about divorce. Really? You never thought about divorcing? Nope. But you've been mad. Oh, yeah. And what'd you do? I've thought about murder, but I've never thought about divorce. She was willing to, before she would divorce him, she would kill him. Now, I know that sometimes in our marriage, we can get angry. And I encourage you, do neither one. See, when you've accepted Jesus, you became part of another covenant, the covenant of grace. God said, I'll make you my child. I will bless you and protect you. I will provide for you. I'm going to be your father. Our part, we can never keep up with. See, in a covenant, 
you give up your rights and you take on responsibility in the covenant of grace, we could never do that. Because when they stood at the Mount Sinai and God said, I want to make you my people, they said, Lord, anything you want us to do, we'll do it. And they failed over and over. You see, we're, as human beings, we're tend, if we're not careful, in our own strength to go to failure. But because of his grace, he gives us strength. He gives us hope. We have a chance all because of him. All we must believe is that Jesus lived this life we couldn't live, and he died the death we should have died. When we believe it and accept it, we come into covenant with God. And you know what he promises never to leave us or forsake us. You see, that's that picture he said of Christ in the church. That he loved us. He came into a covenant with us. He said, you know what? I'm going to love you and treat you like no one else can. And because of that, in everything of life, we simply look to him. Picture of the blessed marriage. We can look to Christ in the church. You see, it's a picture of God, and it's a covenant that he made with us. And as I said when I started out here, I don't know the state of your marriage. I don't know the frustrations with your marriage. I know some in here, with no doubt, have been divorced. I'm not condemning you. God's grace is there. Those of you that are in marriage, you know you need God's grace in the marriage. As you're looking to get married, you need grace to find that one that God has for you, that right one. Now you say, well, Pastor, I'm not looking to get married. I don't know why I'm here today listening to this. Well, it's God's word. We need God's word. We need a picture. But you know what? You know somebody that is struggling with your marriage. Right now, marriages are struggling. Back when this pandemic started, you know what the question was? At the end of this pandemic, will there be more babies born or more marriages dissolved? They wondered which way it would go. Because of God's grace, we have hope. Because of God's goodness and the picture that he's given us, we can see it's his desire. Marriage is still a good thing. I'm going to say that again. Marriage is still a good thing. It's God's plan and God's desire. It's a good thing. You can wait. You can jump in early. Some of you here got married early. I was 20 and my wife 19 when we got married. We were in college. We were like, wow. I don't know if this is much the right thing to do. We just felt like we found the right one. Some people wait till their 30s, 40s, 50s. Some people find love later in life. That's okay. But it's blessed by God. And it's a picture of him <laughs> and the church. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your love and your goodness to us. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for your touch. Thank you for everything that you do. Lord, we know that marriage is honorable and, Lord, is not to be entered into you lightly. It's something that you have set up. It's something that you have given us. Lord, when it gets tough, we can trust in you and rely upon you knowing that you care for us. Lord, when we go through hard stuff, Lord, and people would say, just, just, just end it. It's not worth it. We know that it is worth it in you. So, Lord, I pray right now for each one here today, that we'll just receive what you have for us. The Lord, we'll receive what your word has given us. The Lord, we know that the greatest thing we need is that relationship with you. Lord, we can't do this on our own. We can't live life. We can't have our marriage. Lord, we can't do any of this by ourselves. We need Lord, so I ask that you speak to each heart right now. Where are they with you? Have they placed their trust in you? Have they placed their hope in Jesus? Or are they doing it all by themselves? Lord, I believe that we need you. And that's what your word says. Church, with your heads bowed, I want to ask you a very simple question. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you given your life 
to him? Have you turned over everything about your life to Jesus? And allow him to carry you, to keep you, to hold you. The scripture says in Romans, it says if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe that he rose from the dead, we shall be saved. Saved from the wrath of God, saved from an eternity in hell, saved from the curse. He wants to save you today. So I want to pray a very simple prayer. And if you feel like you need to pray this prayer, that the Spirit is speaking to you and saying, I love you, come to Jesus. I want you to pray this and believe it as you pray it. The scripture says you shall be saved. Maybe you hear and you've prayed this prayer in the past. And you've prayed it numerous times. I'm going to ask you to pray it once again with those that may be praying it for the first time. If you're watching by Facebook, pray this prayer with me. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the dead. Based on that confession, according to your word, I am saved. My sins are gone, and heaven's my home. Thank you, Jesus, for changing my life. Amen. Would you stand right now? Would you please sing this song with them and... It simply says, turn your eyes upon Jesus.